for our Eucharistic Convention 1996. For those of us who are privileged to be here on Friday evening, you will remember that our opening address was given by Father George Rutler from New York. And his theme then was, Be not afraid, I am with you always. It's appropriate that after the benediction, we accept wholeheartedly the theme of Father Rutler's closing address, which concerns the prisoner of love in our midst. The very Reverend Dr. George Rutler. Your Excellency, the Bishop of Auckland, my brother clergy, religious, my altar boy friend Bart, and my brothers and sisters in our risen Lord. I thank you for the honor of having been able to address, along with so many others, this Eucharistic convention. And I also bid you adieu for the time being, since I have to go and catch a plane plane of which I told you about the other day, and according to the rules of nature and the international date line, I am going to be in Los Angeles an hour ago. <laughs> and at 11 o'clock tonight, I'll be in New York City. We take these things for granted, and yet we seem to have such a convoluted time understanding the mysteries of the Mass. One great mystery is that term, the prisoner of love. We just celebrated a Mass, and the closing hymn of that Mass said, Christ has burst his three days prison. Why then do we speak of a prisoner? Well, in the church to which I am returning, where I live in Midtown Manhattan, every day during the week, every day we have a benediction of the Blessed Sacrament as we've celebrated it right now, and we end with a prayer, may the heart of Jesus in the most blessed sacrament be praised, adored, and loved with grateful affection in all the tabernacles of the world, even to the end of time. So we are united, you here in New Zealand and, and I uh, in America, around this prisoner of love. He's imprisoned in the tabernacle. But how can that be if he's burst his three-day prison precisely because the prisoner is also the jailer? Jesus Christ has burst his three days prison and he has voluntarily arranged to be with us in all the tabernacles of the world by his design and the design of his heavenly Father and the design of the Holy Spirit, the love between them. No one takes my life from me, he says. I lay it down of my own. And as the letter to the Philippians reminds us, in triumph, he still takes the form of a slave. He came into this world and took the form of a slave. And now in the glory of the ascension, he is able to be with us all in that triumphant servitude, not imprisoned by us, no longer, but a prisoner of his own free will for our sakes. St. John Vianney, the curé d'Ars at the altar, said in his great simplicity that peasant priest who had spent all his priesthood in that one shabby little village in the backwater of France, what a great thing the priesthood is. I can take the good God 
and place him on this part of the altar and then I can lift him and place him on that part. And to pious ears that may sound almost too crude, but to those same ears would appear crude those words that Jesus had become a slave for our sake. If our world does not understand that fully, there is one who does. And that is the one who tried to make Jesus a prisoner forever. He tried everything he could. He spat on him. He beat him. He used nails. And then he used a stone on a tomb. But none of it worked. When that prince of lies possessed a man in the Holy Land, he couldn't help in the presence of Christ crying out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? I know who you are. The Prince of Lies always hides behind the plural. He comes to us in popularity contests. He tells us his lies are a majority opinion of the population and therefore they must be true and so on. But in the presence of the eternal truth, he himself, the prince of lies, has to tell the one truth that he dares speak. I know who you are. Behind all the lies of the world against the prisoner of love is that one truth that even Satan must acknowledge. Amen. I know who you are. But that is his eternal torment because he tried to keep God his prisoner and it didn't work. And now forever he is haunted with the knowledge that no matter how many sins and crimes he can work in our society, in our families, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our kitchens, in our bedrooms, that Christ has the key to his own prison. In that parish of which I spoke in New York, on feast days, by a venerable old tradition, we have nearly 30 masses every day, every feast day. Our busiest day of the year actually is Ash Wednesday. When many people, not even Catholic, come to hear a priest say, Remember, man, that dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. This year we had nearly 20,000 in that parish. They did not all come back at Easter. For if we have lived in a century that has turned the world to ash, we know one thing, that we are going to be ash. But the prisoner of love wants us to spend the rest of the days with him so that he might raise us up in glory. And that only can happen when we realize why he is in prison for our sake, why he died for our sake. In a recent survey of various countries, my country, Germany, India, Australia, and probably I think all countries would fit into this survey, yours as well. People were asked to identify various symbols 92% of all asked could identify the five Olympic circles. Some 88% could identify the shell of the Shell Oil Company and the golden arches of the McDonald's. But barely half, 52%, could even identify the name of those two pieces of wood, the Holy Cross. It is through the sacrifice of the cross that we have the sacrifice of the Mass. Hard to understand. Let me say two things which may sound shocking at first. One, the Mass is not a miracle. A miracle is a great gift of God 
that works through nature, God's way, once. A unique event. And that's why they're hard to believe. The Mass is more than a miracle. It happens more than once. It happens in New York at my altar. It happens here in Auckland, the altar around which you gather. It happens throughout the world. So it is a more wonderful thing even than a miracle. We have no word for it, really. And the second astonishing thing I'm going to say is that if you really want to understand the prisoner of love, if you really want to make a worthy communion, you need a PhD. Not the kind you're thinking of. You know, a lot of people with those degrees who do not know anything about the prisoner of love. Although God gave them minds, and they should use those minds to understand that profound mystery of which the greatest minds in history have not only written but sung hymns. A woman said at the first parish I arrived at as a curate after my ordination, when we heard you were coming, my daughter said, we don't need another bookworm in this parish. <laughs> but when we saw you, we were relieved because you don't look intelligent at all. <laughs> the PhD of which I speak is the purity of Mary, the humility of Mary, the devotion of Mary. I wish, my Lord, to receive you with the purity, humility, and devotion with which your most holy mother received you, with the spirit and the fervor of the saints. How do we get that purity? Through prayer, her kind of prayer. Do you remember when our Lord healed the demoniac? The people in the town were astonished and they were frightened because they found him clothed, seated, and in his right mind. And that means that he had been naked because Satan wants us to be naked. He wants us to be ashamed. He wants us to disgrace ourselves. It is pure prayer, constant, not just prayer in our prayer hour, but our workday consecrated to our prayer, our morning offering when we wake up, our commitment to our guardian angel when we go to bed. It lets us understand what our bodies and souls are all about and makes us true Catholics and not Puritans. That same curé d'or saw a man praying before the blessed sacrament in the tabernacle and was so moved at how this farmer intently prayed before going to work. Before dawn, he asked him, how do you pray? The man said, I just look at the good God and he looks at me. Je vise le bon Dieu, le bon Dieu m'avise. And that great master of prayer, the curé d'Ars, said, that is the highest of all prayer. And just as that demoniac, when healed, was found seated, we know that the devil always wants us to be restless, moving around. And so... Humility is only to be found not by wandering about and seeking different states in life, but by finding our Lord where he has placed us, avoiding distraction, and as the old Romans said, do as you're doing. And that demoniac when healed was also in his right mind, you see, Satan wants to distract our minds and derange them so we follow lies instead of truths. And the deepest lie of all is that we're gods. And so if we want to be really devout, have that D of the PhD, we have to acknowledge that he is God in that tabernacle. We must avoid inordinate self-love. Not self-love. Self-love is good. We must love our neighbor as we love ourselves. If we don't love ourselves, we cannot love our neighbor. But inordinate self-love is loving ourselves more than our neighbor and more than God. As I've said, the great doctors of the church have lived this, not in spite of their intellects, but through their intellects. St. Thomas Aquinas of an incomparable mind, 
sang the hymns we sing. He wrote those hymns that we sing at benediction. Visus tactus gustus in te fallitur. Fides qui ex auditu in te creditur. Taste, touch, vision. Fail to discern the prisoner of love. Faith which comes through hearing pierces through the veil. We're told that the highest art form is music. Hearing is the closest sense we have to the gift of heaven, the perception of heaven, and the Lord of heaven in our midst. But we have to hear God, and our world is deaf. I was seated in a train station in the United States waiting to go to a talk, the man who was going to pick me up was somewhat late. And in that darkened train station, I sat rather alone. And suddenly, half a dozen youths came in, in leather jackets and chains. All kinds of chains, as a matter of fact. And I thought, this is a time, perhaps, for an act of contrition. But in that very moment, they began to do something very beautiful. They began to sign words. They were deaf. They were using sign language. They were on a field trip from a school for the deaf. Obviously, a school with not a very good uh, dress code. <laughs> but in their deafness, they were able to do something that I couldn't do, make these beautiful signs. And if we are deaf through sin to the voice of God, he gives us sign language, his body. His body, his flesh and blood. Under signs are bread and wine, but no longer bread and wine. And we can only really discern that, although it's true in itself, whether or not we acknowledge it, by listening to him. And if we are deaf, forget the ears. We listen to God anyway with our hearts. St. Francis de Sales said, Cor and cor locutor, heart speaks to heart. Mary Magdalene went into the Easter garden and saw a figure she thought was the gardener. And she wasn't mistaken. For Christ is the real gardener. He's come to restore paradise which we turn to weeds through rebellion. And she says, they've taken my Lord away. I do not know where they've laid him. The tabernacle was empty. The stone was rolled away. The door opened. And our Lord said, Mary, Mary. Heart speaks to heart. And because she had opened her heart to him, she was able to hear the voice. We have closed our heart to our Lord. And the surest sign of that is the failure of our society to kneel before God in adoration. We have lost the art of worship. And that's one reason, for instance, in the middle of Manhattan, we have benediction every day. We preach, yes. But the real conversion comes when people kneel before God, along with all the angels and with all the saints. The Mass is not entertainment. And that's why we shouldn't applaud other people, no matter how well their music may sound. We shouldn't applaud the servers. We shouldn't applaud the ushers. We shouldn't clap. We shouldn't dance around as though it's our party. We kneel before our blessed Lord <laughs> and say as Mary did, Rabboni, Master, in the United States now, we have a phenomenon, some evangelical groups, fundamentalist groups, opening large churches designed after malls. In the 18th century, some churches were designed after opera halls. But the center of our culture now seems to be the shopping mall. And these churches really look like shopping malls. You go in, they have fast food, restaurants in some of them. They have video games to keep the children busy, and then the worship space, no cross, and just a little band and a man who speaks some platitudes. 
And one of the ministers of one of these groups went to Europe to get some architectural ideas for his mall church. He saw the great cathedrals of Europe and he came back and he said, none of them was user friendly. <laughs> if you went into the temple in Jerusalem, you would have been horrified. It wasn't user friendly. Certainly not if you were a bull or a goat. But when our Lord walked into that temple, he said it was his father's house. And he cast out those who had made it a den of thieves. And he says, I tell you, if you knock this temple down, in three days I will raise it up again. I can destroy this. I can raise it up again. For he is the living temple. This is a mystery that the temple himself should be in the tabernacle of the temple. In Greek mythology, we know the story probably of Prometheus, the son of Iapetus, by a woman named Clymene. And according to this legend, he went to the heavens of the gods, and he stole fire and he brought it down to earth. And the king of all the gods, Zeus, was furious. And so he sent to him the first woman, Minerva, uh, uh, um, Pandora, with a box full of all the world's troubles. Prometheus outwitted Zeus and had his brother, Epimetheus, marry this Pandora. You see, there's a, in, the, in the pagan religions, there's a competition between God and the human race. Prometheus had gone to heaven, then again to get the fire back with the agency of the goddess of wisdom, Minerva. And when Zeus saw this, he finally decided to destroy Prometheus. Prometheus was bound to Mount Caucasus and his fate was to have his liver eaten away by vultures. And when the liver was consumed, it would grow back. So his agony would be perpetual. He was finally rescued by Hercules. But you see what that story is saying. God is jealous of us. He wants to keep his fire, his light in heaven. Why? Because in those legends, he's not a real God at all. The true God sends fire to us from heaven. His Holy Spirit and it is the Holy Spirit that we invoke in the Holy Eucharist on these gifts of bread and wine so that they become no longer creatures of bread and wine, but they become the body and blood of Christ who wants us to be raised up as his sons and daughters. And that is precisely why we kneel before him. And that is why in the old rites we use that language of humility, quasi most depreche more humilitaire. We beg, we beseech humbly, because it is only by that humility that we can conquer the lie of pride and know our own real dignity. God knows who we are better than we do. And that's why we have that story of the boy who asked Michelangelo at the unveiling of the statue of Moses, the question all the grown-ups wanted to ask but didn't dare. How did you do it? And Moses said to the little, uh, Michelangelo said to the little boy, I just took a block of marble and I chipped away everything that was not Moses. That is what our Lord does to us in the sacrament of confession. We can only receive our Lord, the prisoner of love, if our hearts are full of love and not of sin. Is this beneath the intelligence of the world? How little our intelligence is. How little we know of this man of love. I told some of you I think of the woman who went to a jewelry shop up on Fifth Avenue in New York to get a necklace as a confirmation gift. A, a cross. And the woman behind the counter said, what kind of cross do you want? A plain one? 
or one with a little man on it. We may chuckle, but millions of people have died for all eternity because they only saw a little man. And we will die too if we only see things in the Holy Eucharist. Our Holy Father tells us we live in a culture of death. A prominent woman in my country when the Pope came and was preaching about the culture of death said what the Pope means by a culture of death is really freedom of choice. And she was right. She was right to this extent that if we think we can choose reality, then we will die. That's why Adam and Eve were not allowed to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God didn't want to keep them stupid. He gave them minds. But to partake of that fruit meant that you could redefine reality. And when you redefine reality, you die because only the truth can give us life. A few years ago, Mr. Nikita Khrushchev said to the Western world and to all the free world, we will bury you. And our knees knocked because we thought maybe he would. Well, there's a convent in Moscow recently reopened. The sisters sing the psalms for the dead who are buried in the cemetery outside. The Mother Superior is a convert from communism. She was a prominent communist figure. Must be a very powerful Mother Superior. (laughs) And in one of the graves in their cemetery over which they sing is buried Nikita Khrushchev. Our Lord is the Lord of the living and he calls all of us from our graves And we know that because the final sign he had that he had to go to Jerusalem and die was the raising of Lazarus. But that was a resuscitation. Lazarus would die again. In the Holy Eucharist, he calls all of us to come out of the graves of sin, not just physical sin, but moral sin, so that we might live forever. In the Mass, we say, do this for the memory of me. It doesn't mean a memorial like a testimonial dinner. The word, the Greek anamnesis, means the unforgetting, the bringing us back to reality. And this is why the holy sacrifice of the Mass is celebrated in a solemn way, not a sad way but in a way that's too great for mere conviviality or jollity 